Uh, before I start, I want to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation. It's an honor for me to be here in Israel. It's my first time. And um, I'm going to share some of the uh, some thoughts that we have been working the last uh, few years in relation to food products and food systems in general. So far, we have been talking about food security, which is very important. Uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Doyle will be talking about um, food safety, and I'll be talking about functional foods. It's a, it's a very interesting area, and I'm not sure if you are familiarized with the concept of functional foods, but I'll be describing it as we go through the presentation. Some facts. There's increasing rates of chronic diseases. Cardiovascular is the number one killer in many countries. Cancer, the number of cancer uh, cases in, in the world are increasing as well because of, of the genetics and the diet. Obesity, more than 20% in many states in the United States of the population is, is something very dramatic and those numbers are increasing. We're talking about one billion people that uh, go to, to bed hungry. Well, there's one billion people that are overweight in the world. So diet and the way things are, are uh, uh, you know, the way we relate to the food is maybe something that we need to think about in terms of uh, choices. This is a, a graph showing the U.S. food market, uh, annual sales, and you can see that the U.S. conventional food industry, that would be any, any product like yogurt, uh, bread, and, and so on, it's about $486 billion in, in sales per year. From that, $20 billion is what we call functional foods, these special foods that have chemical compounds, it could be extracts or, or an extract of a plant or a fruit that have a unique property to it of beneficial effects to health. And then you have $120 billion for uh, drugs and 50.3 for dietary supplements that would be the pills. So you can see that, that there is a growing market there. That functional food market is growing 10% per, per year. So I was saying that the functional food is very similar to a normal food. It's just that it has some physiological benefits that goes beyond nutritional functions, and nutritional functions will be covered later. But this one here deals with the specific chemical compounds that can be related to the prevention and maybe stopping or deferring the progression of, of certain diseases. Now, what the government is doing in many countries is trying to educate people to make right choices about food products. In the U.S., they educate by making things like the pyramids, showing what to eat, what not to eat, or even researchers like in my case and many other colleagues around the U.S. and around the world are trying to study different types of products to see which ones are the ones that have higher levels of antioxidants. And the impact is that if we are able to determine which ones are the ones that have more activity, those are the ones that are highly demanded. So research has really a big impact on this. It's very common now to see a yogurt, which was a common yogurt. Now it's a functional food yogurt. Why? Because they added some, some extracts into it. The thing is that there's a brilliant future for plant natural products. 80% of the world population, now we're talking about rich and poor, depend on natural products for health treatments. 250,000 superior plant species. From those, only 5 to 15% have been investigated. So diversity, the amount of species out there, we have not investigated. More than 160,000 bioactive natural compounds have been discovered so far, and there's 10,000 added each year. And, and just to give you an idea, in numbers, 20 of the best-selling drugs derive from natural compounds. So, so you can see this relationship between, even in the formal pharmaceutical industry, they do depend on these natural products. So I'm focusing my talk in biodiversity to be aware of this. We don't focus too much on biodiversity. And, 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 and even though we've been talking about crop production, which is very important, there are resources, there are genetic material out there that we are not considering and we're letting it go, this pool of genes. Here's an example in South America. You have three centers of biodiversity, the Andean region, the Andes, you have the Amazon in the northern part of the tropical uh, uh, Amazon or the tropical uh, or subtropical areas of Colombia and Venezuela. And you find 
thousands of species of products that can provide us the things that we need. Just to get a little go back in history, potatoes, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, peanuts, maize, papers, all of them come from the Andean region. And we don't know. How many varieties of potatoes do you think exist in Peru? 4,000 varieties of potatoes. 4,000 varieties of potatoes. You come here to Israel, some other country, six, 10 at most, commercial. But 4,000 varieties of potatoes with different chemical compounds that are there for us to discover and use in cosmetics, health-related, dietary supplements, for chronic diseases, and so on. So crop diversity, that's what we need to focus on. Just to give you an example about Peru, because I'm originally from Peru, and even though I studied in California and now I'm working in Texas, I had the opportunity to see both worlds, so I think I know a little bit about both sides. And just going back to Peru, 17,000 plant species representing 7% of the world's diversity. And basically nothing has been explored. So a strategy for uh, uh, you know, trying to conserve and exploit these, uh, these biodiversity has to, be some, it has to be done from the point of view of a sustainable use of these centers. I mean, they're there, but if you look at the markets that I was just explaining at the beginning, they are eager to access to these materials. And knowing that, that many of these biodiversity areas belong to the poor parts of the world, this is the ironic side. The poors do have gold in their hands, and they don't know it. And it's their opportunity to really um, progress in life and, and overcome some of the problems that we talked about. Because it would be a win-win relationship where all these markets in the, the first world will take advantage of. And if these products are used in a rational way, protecting them, they will also win. So this thing about potatoes and sweet potatoes and conquering the world, as it happened before, it can happen again in this new, new, in this new opportunities. So you will see things like mashua, which has anti-carcinogenic properties. We already studied that. Like yakon, which is full of fructooligosaccharides, which are not absorbed by the body. They're sweet. So for people that suffer diabetes, it would be perfect. Oka, maca, all these are tubers and roots that have been there for centuries. Red sweet potato, a source of pigments, and purple maize. So I'll end up here so we can continue with our presentations. Thank you.